Juliet Brodsky interviewing Philip Twig QC. Thank you very much for making time to do the oral history for us. Thank you. Should I be pedantic and say the Honourable Philip Twig QC? Because you may. That's my title in retirement after being a judge of the District Court. And you've just recently celebrated a birthday, a very important birthday, your 80th. Yes. I don't know whether it was by design, but I was born on April Fool's Day 1932, so my 80th birthday last Sunday was on the 1st of April. Fortunately, I was born after midday, so they couldn't play the practical jokes on me. And you never get those pinches and kicks that other kids sometimes get for being April Fool's. There was another very significant happening that year, 1932, and that was the opening of the Sydney Harbour Bridge. Yes, I was there, in a sense. In your mum's tummy? Yes. (laughs) Did your mother ever talk about that day? No, not really. Um, She talked about it en passant, but it was not really a significant feature. It was just one of the things everybody did at the time. But I feel sad about that because those who read the history of the making the bridge are fascinated by it. And she never really did talk about it. Not even the infamous incident when Colonel de Groot galloped up and slashed the opening ribbon? Well, well, my belief is that it probably happened uh, when they were there. And it was on the day, uh, that uh, the 29th of March when it was open, just a couple of days before I was born. Maybe, of course, that swishing of sword brought me on. Your family, of course, you have quite a number of legal people in your family and I would like to talk a little bit about your father, Adrian Twigg, who was a very well-known and well-regarded solicitor in his day. Yes, he was admitted in 1926, which was uh, supposedly the good time, but it became tough, didn't it? And um, he was determined to make something of it and he had a partner uh, who went to the Second World War, but Adrian then called the firm Adrian Twigg & Company after he had been billed as Adrian C.R. Twig, and he wanted both Peter and me to be part of it, rather than the employed solicitors which he had. So he continued it on through the war and beyond, and Peter and I inherited it. Now, of course, Peter's dead. The firm uh, was taken over by Peter's middle son, a very brilliant lawyer named Mark Twig, but sadly Mark died a couple of years ago at a very early age in his 40s from cancer, and so the firm Adrian Twig & Company is just a plaque on a wall in the last resting place for it. Where is this plaque? I'd like to take a photo. It's in... Um, um, the street's escaping me, but where the police academy is, that street that goes up there from Wentworth Avenue is where Adrian Twig & Company was in a, a building just past the first lane. Hunter Street? No, no, that's far too far down the east. It'll come to you in a minute, I can go and look it up, but we won't interrupt this and I'll find it for you later and let you know. Your father had an extensive common law practice. Was he away from home a great deal? Was he constantly busy? Oh, he was constantly busy, but um, he realised when family came along that he had to be with them. And um, we called my mother the old ogre. She was a very strong Irish lady, very poor, came from a family of 12, So she was keen on pushing Adrian along. And so he really wasn't just in the police courts, as they called them then. He was early on. But um, he, when the Family Law Act came in, concentrated on it. He always claimed that he was partly responsible because the Family Law Act concentrated on a, a new domicile. The American war brides only had the American domicile and when they got abandoned... They couldn't get any redress. Adrian saw a way around that, and it was a bonanza. So he then practised very extensively in family law and even appeared in full court and once in the high court on a family law matter. When the Family Law Act was passed in 1975, was there any mention made of your father and the important contribution he made? No, and that didn't matter to him. He, he, well, I think he was probably gone to God by then. Hadn't he? No, of course he... Uh, yes, he died in the end of... in the 50s. Was there no acknowledgement anywhere, written or otherwise? No, there was not, which is sad, but uh, it's there in my mind and I write about it in my memoirs. But no, although he did that very important act that brought it on, it was Garbawick who took it up. He was a great friend of Adrian's, actually, and Adrian briefed him quite a lot. But Sir Garbawick was the mover and shaker, and Ken Manning, of course, Justice Ken Manning, pushed it along until, as you know, uh, it was the building opened in the 1970s. 
the home of the bar, and it really was. Well, we will return to that in due course, but just briefly while you mention it, Sir Garfield Barwick, did he actually make any mention of his old friend with regard to the Family Law Act? No. You don't know Gar very well. He was the most egotistical person anybody knew. There was a dear magistrate named Finlay who was most proper. Everything had to be done properly. Gar Barwick, when he objected, wouldn't at all. He'd move about in his chair, perhaps. So dear old Mr Finlay said, Mr Barwick, do you think it might be proper if when you make an objection you rose from the bar table? Gar paused a while and slid his elbow along the table and said, Why? That was the arrogant Gar Barwick. He didn't care a jot about anybody but himself. I heard he hated writing judgments too. Absolutely. He he wasn't good at writing anything, actually, although he had a great flair for literacy. But quite right, he didn't like writing judgments and he got someone else to do all that hard work when he was on the High Court. You're quite right. Your father, Adrian Twigg, went to Fort Street High School, which is a very eminent old Sydney uh, high school, and I believe he was much influenced there by the headmaster, Mr Kilgore. Yes, Kilgore. That, that, I don't know whether he's German or Irish or what, but he certainly had the ability to see the good in his students. He had a couple of other students whose names escaped me, but um, he was significant in Adrian's life in that he saw that if there was hard work, Adrian had the ability to do it, and he was dead right. Adrian had the spark to lead. What were Adrian's favourite subjects at school? Was he fond of Latin? No, he wasn't. He was like I when I had to do it at university. He just had to do it, he thought. But no, um, he he was literally minded. He was a great reader, had a great library, an enormous library, the whole of Scott's works and that sort of thing, which Peter has, or Peter's widow. And uh, he, he was very good at that sort of classicism. And Kilgore encouraged that very much. And that made Adrian a very good advocate. Not only was he a fierce cross-examiner, but he could put submissions together and read law like any good QC. So he was erudite. Very erudite. And but, but learned and erudite, not just wise, erudite, but uh, learned as well, because he was a terrific reader. He attended University of Sydney. Adrian? No, he didn't. He did. The, what did he do? The Solicitor's Admission Board course, as he made Peter do. He thought it was the best way to learn. Keep working, do your studies at night, just as I did, <laughs> he used to say. But I was the lucky one because I got the chance to do an arts degree. I didn't complete it until later. But then LLB and that sort of thing, which well, I thought I was very privileged. But Peter uh, was not. He was admitted as an article clerk, studied through working by day and studying at night, and that's hard, but he did it very well. 